Hi, everybody. I am Jacob Hewn. I work at Protocol Labs. Uh, I'm an engineering manager, and I currently lead the Bedrock team. Um, and so what's the Bedrock team? Very quickly, so if you care about finding data on the network, we operate network indexers. We run a lot of this infrastructure. We partner with other people to do this. We work on data transfers, so improving underlying reliability of existing transfer protocols and then evolving those in the future. So I think Molly said at the beginning that we've, we've improved, we've almost doubled success rates of online data transfer. Still quite a bit there to go, um, but we're working on that and continuing to improve that. And then Boost, we also work on, which I'll talk more about right now. Um, so the course of this talk, uh, we'll go kind of quick three things, the history of Boost what Boost can do today, and then what the future of Boost might, might look like. What are we focusing on? And so quickly to dive into the origins of Boost. So back in August of last year in Lotus 1.11.1, we released a split markets and miner process. So Lotus prior to that was a monolithic set. And this created problems when you're onboarding lots of data, you're consuming a lot of processes, this can conflict with storage providers getting to window posts. So how do we separate those two so that we can independently scale and so that we can protect that minor process? And so this is kind of the architecture that we've moved into where on the right, upper right, markets becomes this kind of interface for clients. Like this is ultimately where you're making deals, where data is coming in, where data is going out, and then your mining, your stealing processes can then be protected. They can be run on completely separate machines, which is really great. And we'll have some discussions on what this looks like uh, for scaling in the near future. So in with that foreshadowing, uh, that markets process, in order to do all of this work, we needed to take a lot of these internal code interfaces and actually build APIs around them. So allow the markets node to talk with the Lotus miner process over RPC APIs, right? And so this set up the future of what we'd be able to do and create with Boost. And so while we did separate those two processes out, there were still a lot of remaining challenges there, right? We wanted to make sure that for the markets process, for client usability, for storage provider usability, that we could reduce our time to release. We want to make sure that we're landing improvements and patches quickly, and those don't have to match up with Lotus release cycles, right? These can be independent. And so we also want to improve that storage deal reliability, right? So currently, I think previously, a lot of storage providers were getting around issues with online data transfer by doing offline imports. And so moving data externally and then importing that locally. So how can we improve a lot of this? And then how do we get better UX for storage providers and for clients? A lot of visibility into this system was like really hard to get at. Um, and so we wanted to expose more of that and provide more tooling and better APIs for storage providers, other builders in the ecosystem to be able to extend all of this work. So how do we go about doing that? So spoiler alert, Boost came from Lotus. So this is why we're best friends because if you tear something out of somebody and then you make a new thing, you gotta be best friends, right? So best friends. Um, yeah, so we ultimately took the markets process out of Boots, out of Lotus. So if you run Lotus today, you can still run a Lotus markets process, but you can shut that down and run Boost in its place, right? And so this is kind of the evolution of how do we create these companion apps that we can then scale independently. And so the first thing that we released Boost with in June uh, is when it released is a new storage deal protocol. And so this is the storage deal protocol 1.2 which we'll talk about in a bit. And the big thing here is we're allowing extensibility of transfer protocols. So if you wanted to store data prior to protocol 1.2, if you're still using 1.1, you have to do that over graph sync or you have to do it offline. Those are the only two options for storing data. And so what we wanted to do is we noticed that a lot of people were packing up data, throwing car files on servers, and then curling that down, doing the transfer, and then storing that data. So, hey, let's build a thing that meets them where they're at. And so this actually used to be a flow for textile created BidBot, and this was the flow that they used. And so when we released Boost, we enabled them to just use the new deal protocol, and then that transfer automatically happened. So there's no, removed this manual step for storage providers. 
So we also shipped with a basic libp2p HTTP protocol. When you're just packing and sending very large files, you don't really need to care about the underlying DAG. You just want to get the thing from the client to the storage provider. And so libp2p HTTP is just a bare bones bytes transfer. Um, and we actually worked with the estuary team to land this in their system as well as part of launch. Cool. And then with that, we also added unique identifier to deals. So as we've started, as the longevity, the life cycle of these systems has increased, you might want to renew deals, right? So the PCID for that data was kind of the unique identifier, but this creates problems when you might have that piece in multiple places, right? Maybe it's in a sector that's about to expire and then it's gonna be in the new sector for the piece. That's not super helpful when you wanna look at a deal and you're looking at by the underlying data that might exist in two places. And so we added some unique identifiers for that. And then we also added the deal storage protocol, which lets you leverage that new unique identifier to query that information, get more accessibility to folks. So where we're at today, we can kind of look at adoption. And here you'll see this isn't Lotus versus Boost. This is the markets protocol. Because what we're doing is we crawl the network based on every markets actor who's announcing their multi-adders. And we see which libp2p protocols they support. Which version of markets are you running? Today, we know that if you're running 1.2, you're running Boost because it's the only implementation to date. Um, but if you're running 1.1, this could be Lotus, which a lot of it is, or it could be Venus. It could be any other implementation that's running the v.1 markets protocol. And so right now, we're slowly growing up over time. I think people are celebrating Halloween and Diwali or maybe prepping for the 1.18 shark upgrade. Um, but hopefully we'll get that up in the near future. And so the other thing that we're also tracking is raw byte power and quality adjusted power for boost notes. And so right now we're about 470 pibbytes of QAP and about 170 pibs of RBP. Uh, and our market share for boost is right about 17% of total markets node. That number is a little bit higher for actually folks that are actively making deals right now that number comes from folks that are just running the protocol and not folks that are actually ingesting. What we want to do is transition over to storage rate by implementation. So we can actually track ingestion rate of data to see how well Boost is scaling over time. And so Lily uh, runs chain data, does some analysis on that. We want to take that data cross section that with the information that we have a markets implementation so that we can monitor this ingestion rate over time. So, history, yay, let's talk about what's in Boost. So, one of the things I wanna do, because we talked about getting up to speed in this ecosystem can be a little bit painful. Um, one of the things we added recently that will give you some spoilers for uh, some of the things that we have is if you go to the Boost repo, there is uh, the ability to spin up a DevNet. And what this does is it spins up a Lotus Genesis node, a Lotus full node that exposes your RPC API this also runs on eight kilobyte sectors, so you don't have to spin up huge, huge nodes. You can run a full cluster on your local machine. Super easy to do. Um, we'll see a little recording of, of some of that in a bit. Uh, this also spins up your boost node, an experimental HTTP retrieval server that we've kind of built to make it easier for the Evergreen program to replicate data, uh, an experimental bit swap retrieval server, which we'll, we'll talk about more in a second, um, as well as optional monitoring clusters. Um, so you can get in there, get Grafana information, get Prometheus data, like all, all there. And then a sample deal script. So if you have never made a deal with Lotus node locally, you can walk through that process and we'll show that right now. So here we're just SSHing into a Docker image, our Docker image for boost. And then we're gonna run the sample deal script. And so this is kind of a tutorial that will walk you through exactly what's going on, as well as the commands to run it. So you can experience that whole thing. And then you'll see some fatal stuff here, but that is because of ultimately like, there's a little bit of wait that needs to happen before things are propagated locally on chain. And so you can just rerun that and that'll automatically happen. Ways to generate car files, calculate comp P with the boost CLI, make your deal, publish it, and then pull up the UI, see your data, you can do all of this locally and it takes about 30 minutes or less, which is, is pretty great because that used to be a very time consuming process. So you can spin up that cluster locally and move on with your life. Cool. 
Uh, so with that, with Boost, we also released a, a pretty simple web UI. Um, you can see a lot of failures here. So one of the things we like to do is dog food. So this is the storage provider that the Boost team runs, thanks to Anton. Um, and so you can see here, like, hey, we're having a problem with a client. We should dig in to see who's doing that, um, see what's going on. So maybe we can help improve some of that software. With that, we can also dig into the, the deals as well. And we can go through and see full event logs of what's happening when is data being transferred, what issues are there, are we getting hookups, is it on the client side, is it on the boost side, where are these problems existing, so that we can reach out to those groups and say, how can we help, is it a client issue, is it a data transfer issue, where's the problem so we can help fix it and make that system better. So you also get a lot of insights into storage space. One of the things we noticed prior to moving over, it was, it was difficult and tedious to, to get into the underpinnings, like what's beneath the hood in Lotus. Um, so we worked to make sure that we had more exposure to those APIs and that we could expose those to users as well. And then you can also see ceiling pipeline. If you like snap deals, you can see everything that's coming up for acti uh, upcoming activation. You can look at your regular sectors. You can also keep track of where your funds are going, what's being tagged for publishing, for collateral, all that stuff. And then one common uh, question we get is, what about a CLI? Web UI is really nice if you're running a, a small provider, but if you have to do a lot of automation and regular tasks, that can be super annoying. So what do we do about that? Um, so again, one of the things that we wanted to do when we're building Boost is focus on extensibility. And so with this, we created a GraphQL API, and this is what the web UI uses. Anything you can do in the web UI, you can do in GraphQL. And so ultimately what this exposes is the ability to query everything, the ability to manage deals, so you can publish, you can cancel that, you can execute all of that with curls or anything that you can run over HTTP. You can also manage your escrow funds, and you can subscribe to new deals, deal updates. So in the web UI, you'll be able to see deals changing over time. And so there is a, on the docs site, boost.filecoin.io GraphQL API. You can actually go through here, and Dirk's got a little video of how to take and go through this explorer that runs locally with Boost. And you can actually go through there and compose curl commands so you could create your own bash scripts, you could create your own CLIs on top of it. Again, more extensibility because the Boost team is currently a very, very small team, can't build a lot of stuff, and so we want to make sure other people can do that. So I talked about these experimental services. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those. And so ultimately what we wanted to do with Boost is make sure we're not baking it into a monolithic API. Storage providers need to be able to scale things independently. So how do we make sure that we can do that successfully? Well, an example of this is the HTTP sidecar retrieval service. And so again, part of the Evergreen program we wanted to do was make it easier for them to transfer car files. And so in order to do this, you can just spin up a Booster HTTP server. Uh, SPs can actually configure what their HTTP endpoint is. Clients will have the ability to discover that HTTP endpoint, and that allows them to fetch that over HTTP much more quickly. So giving more options based on your flows. We're not trying to push people into any one area. Give them the flexibility to do what they need to do. And BitSwap sidecar retrieval. You care about IPFS and you care about interoperability, which I hope you do, because there's a lot of good public data out there. Um, there's also a, a QR code to a demo that Dirk did last week at IPFS camp, where you can actually see this happening live uh, in production. Um, so ultimately, what the BitSwap sidecar does is, along with announced indexes, we'll say, hey, we support BitSwap and we support GraphSync. These are the protocols that we support. Later this year, we'll actually also be able to say, hey, that bit swap transport that you want to talk to, go to this multi-adder, and that will allow us to independently scale these services, right? We can independently scale bit swap retrieval, we can independently scale graph sync retrieval, and we're going to do that over time. Remote comp P. So one of the things we want to do is scale. And so with that, uh, Boost has been a bottleneck for ingesting data. Eventually, you get to the point of you have to run so much comp P that it gets really slow and you can't ingest more data and we're now a bottleneck. There's a bunch of ceiling workers, but we can't leverage them all. So one of the more immediate things that we can do until we get more horizontal scaling with Boost is hand off remote comp, handoff comp calculation to the ceiling workers. So we can say, 
hey, I've got this data in, ceiling worker, can you go ahead and check and make sure that's good to go? And then I'll run into ceiling later. Uh, thanks to Magic, I think did this in like an afternoon uh, after talking with him, uh, gave us the API endpoints that we needed so that again, we could handle that ourselves, uh, which has been really great. So those are some of the features that exist in Boost today. And so what I wanna talk about is a little bit of what we're looking at for the future of Boost. What did the next six to 12 months kind of look like? And the big word is scaling. So the, I think the network growth team is hoping to hit two EBI bytes on the network next year, which is a, a huge number. And so Boost is gonna be, we want that to be a big part of that. How do we improve this? We also have Saturn that just launched and is eventually going to be falling back to storage providers to retrieve data. We need to make sure that we scale. We need to make sure that storage providers can handle that without it causing problems in their system. And so part of this work is Boost is still somewhat stateful. We've gotten most of it pulled out. The thing we're currently working on is the piece directory. And ultimately what this does is all of the data that you store that is being indexed, if you have indexing turned on, hopefully you do, uh, for public data, that the index store or the piece directory keeps track of all those indexes for retrieval. So as users come in, they can go to the piece directory, they can get that information, we can fetch that subset of data, serve it back to them. Right now, that's part of the boost process, and what we wanna do is remove that out to a scalable process so that we can treat boost nodes as ephemeral, so that you can spin them down, spin them up, it doesn't matter, all of that state is contained elsewhere. And so this is a huge thing for us getting to N plus one, boost nodes, which we're hoping to do as part of our work in the coming months. So, and then on this storage side, so kind of a, a rough number that we wanna hit is, is to get to a state where storage providers can pull in at least one pivotabyte per day uh, and beyond. So there may be very, very large storage providers who can do more of that in terms of their ceiling capacity, and we don't want Boost to be a blocker. So how do we get there? And part of this is getting to end to end boost nodes to Lotus workers. So we're gonna be working very closely with the Lotus team. We've had some discussions this past week as well. And so ultimately we wanna make sure that we're in a state where all of this can scale and that the software is not a problem. It's not a blocker for storage providers. So on the retrieval side of things, like this has been a, a big thing that we've been working on in the past months on Bedrock. And so the things that we care about are resiliency, reliability, and performance. We need to scale to meet the needs of the network without causing problems for storage providers. Make that really easy to use. So we're looking at the ability to also scale. We talked about extensibility, modularity of these pieces. We wanna be able to independently scale retrieval and storage. Because onboarding rate and outboarding rate might be different, right? And so how can we independently scale those to meet the needs of those particular storage providers? Because they're likely all not gonna look the same. So the other thing is optimizing for performance and improving visibility and hot paths. We talked about some of this like default monitoring that we're doing. So our team's actually been working on doing like full tracing all the way down from a retrieval comes in through HTTP or BitSwap or GraphSync. We can trace it all the way down to the sealer and see like where are the issues? Like what, what problems do we need to fix so that we can make sure, again, it's not a software problem. And then we wanna make sure that providers have or SPs have the interfaces to optimize their own setup. We want to give them some sane defaults, but then work with them to make sure that they have everything they need to customize it for themselves. And then reducing operational overhead. So one of the big things that we believe on Bedrock is to dog food. Um, and so we run, we have network indexers, we run network indexers. We're building stuff for storage providers. We act as a storage provider. And so as part of what we're doing for scaling, we're actually gonna be increasing the size of one of our own storage providers so that we can deal with the pain points here, like feel the pain, um, when, so we can make sure that all of this is easier to do. We don't wanna be in a situation as a team where like, we've gotta hire somebody to fo uh, focus on running these systems. Like We want that to be as lightweight as possible. We've already made a lot of really good improvements there. I think we used to babysit our storage provider like multiple times today, and now have gotten to a point where that's much lighter, and we wanna get that even lower over time. So the other thing is, if you're having difficulty getting data in or out of Filecoin, come and talk to us. I think there are several folks from Bedrock here. You can raise your hands, wave, say hi. Yeah, talk to all these folks. And yeah, questions, come chat. Hit us up in the, the project repo or on Filecoin Slack.
question, friend. Let's say I have a, a storage or a minor instance of about 10 petabytes. Can you plot the trajectory of the ratio of uh, the number of miners to Lotus instances that are required over the span of, you know, I, I start off uh, completely empty, I'm, I'm fully onboarded, and I'm uh, going to carry that through to the last contract for data retention. What's the rate, what would you plot as the ratio of uh, re market nodes to a 10 pib minor instance across its lifetime. Yeah, so that, I do not have that data off the top of my head. So I think we, this is something that we need to figure out for, for part of our, our motoring, is to figure out what the throughput rate is, what do your outgoing pipes look like, are you ingesting data locally, like how much can you actually ingest, and then what is the throughput rate on all of the ceiling workers, uh, so that we can verify that, but don't have that number right now. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, so Lotus and Boost are best friends, so we don't have to be each other's only friends because nothing about Boost is ultimately specific to Lotus. Uh, are there active plans to integrate Boost with uh, the other implementations, such as Venus and Forest? Yeah, so we're actually, I think, just talking with the Venus team today. So like, some of the stuff that we can do because, again, Boost is separate as an RPC. It, it just talks to Lotus over RPC API. Um, so it's very probable for us to get to a state where we can actually just talk to a Venus cluster uh, and hand data off. And so there is actually, you can join some of that discussion happening right now in the Boost GitHub or the Boost uh, Slack uh, on Filecoin. Um, but that's the state that we would like to get to. There's obvious advantages of having more implementations uh, of markets, um, but we also want to collect them all. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah so. Um... Obviously, uh, Boost is also doing a lot of retrievals right now, and we see with uh, Evergreen that has been running that we actually rely on using something like Boost to actually make this happen. I just wondered, um, in the UI, there is very light uh, coverage of retrievals. Is that something that's going to happen now? I know it happens underneath the hood, but you know, will that also be reflected in the UI at some point? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and I would say yes. And so a lot of the work that we had done leading up to this year was focusing on the storage aspect, like how can we improve some of those aspects. Um, but retrieval is becoming more and more of a problem, especially as we look at the scale of scope that's coming in. So we absolutely do want to improve visibility there uh, and would love to talk to oh, what, what that should look like. <laughs> 